Um, live in Atlanta, Georgia. Some of you know me, uh, Lecrae, and um, really enjoy being in Atlanta. I'm not sure if the uh, economy is uh, similar there and here, or how, it, how it's affecting you all, but I know in Atlanta currently, uh, the economy is, is, is rough, it's tough, and people are struggling trying to find jobs. And, um, you know, I talked to a friend of mine, and he lost the job, and he got to hunting around trying to find employment. And just digging through the newspapers, looking for employment, looking for employment, and, you know, he was kind of at wit's end. And he came across an ad that said that there was employment at uh, the Atlanta Zoo, which is ironically right around the corner from my house. And so he, um, you know, he decides to apply for this job. He goes in, does an interview, applies for the job. And um, as he's in there, they say to him, uh, man, I, I, I need to talk to you, sir, uh, about this job. And he says, OK, well, what, what, what's the deal? He says, well, well, listen, it's not quite what you think it is. Um, the, the thing is, in the Atlanta Zoo, our gorilla exhibit, uh, the gorillas have been sick and not involved. And what we were hoping is to revitalize it. And we were just wanting you to put on a gorilla suit and kind of pretend to be a gorilla until we can reestablish what's going on here. And seriously, he, he, he was like, are you serious? And the guy said, I'm dead serious. And he said, I'm broke, so I'm going to do it. Um, so he puts on his gorilla suit and he goes to work and he's in there and he's dancing and he's playing around. He's kind of getting into it and people are enjoying him as a gorilla. Um, but over time, I think he started to believe he was a gorilla and he was swinging and kind of, you know, swinging from one of the branches to a pole and just got a little too involved and into it and forgot that he was a man in a gorilla costume and he swung himself right over into the lion's cage. Now he realizes as he looks up that I've swung myself into the lion's cage and in full gorilla garb he starts screaming, help! Help! And his people are wondering what in the world is going on, what's, where's this noise coming from? He's just screaming for help. And the lion runs over to him and says, man, if you don't shut your mouth, we both going to lose our jobs. <laughs> that is not a true story at all, <laughs> but it sounded good. Um, the reason why I tell you that story is because I want to set a tone that things are not always as they seem. Things are not always as they seem. And you can pretend you are a gorilla, but it doesn't make you a gorilla. You can pretend that you understand what it means to be a man, men. Ladies, you can pretend you understand what it means to know what a man looks like, what kind of man you should be with. Uh, but it doesn't make him any more of a man or make our understanding of what a man is any realer. Um, things are not always what they appear to be. They're not always as they seem. First of all, I shouldn't be here, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm standing on this stage uh, preaching and teaching, and I'm teaching on the gospel's priority in, 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 in manhood, masculinity, right? And it's ironic because... I didn't grow up with a father to teach me what it meant to be a man. Matter of fact, I had terrible examples of what it meant to be a man. I grew up with a sense of insignificance, a sense of strong insecurity, because I had no good living examples of manhood. Before I was two years old, my father had abandoned us for a crack cocaine addiction. Uh, I began to look up to my uncles. I remember one instance, my uncle took me out. We were hanging out and my uncle was uh, pretty promiscuous, had multiple girlfriends and he told me 
uh, sit right here in the car, little man, let me talk to this young lady. We were on the way to his girlfriend's house, and he stopped to talk to another young lady. We got to his girlfriend's house. His girlfriend asked me, my young, impressionable mind, does he talk to other women? And I'm assuming I'm supposed to tell the truth. And so I'm like, of course. Then I thought you knew this. I woke up in the trunk of his car. He knocked me out, and I woke up in the trunk of his car. And as I screamed, he said, if you don't be quiet, I'm never going to let you out this trunk. These are the idols, these are the, the role models that I had to look up to, right? I grew up with men telling me that I wasn't a man unless I drank more than I needed to drink, slept with more people unless I was a, a fighter. Like all these standards of masculinity and manhood came about be, because I had no real standard. The standard was just created. And now we could be in this room now thinking we understand what it means to be a man and having a grasp on that concept. And some of us are in this room, you know, just sheerly off the fact that you know some of the people who are going to be here speaking. Some of you might be here because you fit the category, Christian. Some of you may be in here because, well, you have no idea why you're here. You just came. But... Few are here because they recognize their lack of understanding of what it means to be a man or ladies what a man looks like. So most of us think we're basically okay. It's like a reoccurring pain that happens to you and you say, ah, what is that? But you don't link it to death or something fatal. But when you get a cancer diagnosis... You start to become an expert. You start to ask questions. Your, 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 your instincts kick in and tell you, wait, this is serious. I need to pay attention. Well, I want to tell you something. We may have cancer here. So it's crucial that we pay attention. This cancer ultimately is sin. Sin has marred us. Marred our perspective of what masculinity and manhood is. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. I'll just kind of breathe over 1 and 2, but I want to spend a little time in Genesis chapter 3. So we know in, in Genesis 1 and 2, God makes man. He breathes life into the man. You know, he puts the man in this wild, untamed world, and he says, hey, I want you to create order. Look at the garden. The garden is orderly. The garden is, 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 is cultivated. I want you to do that to the rest of the planet. God says, look at what I've done. Now you do this. You cultivate. You create. And so man gets out there and begins to do it. He begins naming things. And God makes it clear that man needs a woman. So God creates a woman. Adam sings. The first time you see singing in the Bible because a woman came. And, you know, he begins to cultivate, Right? He begins to cultivate. He begins to do what God has hardwired him to do. See, according to our creative design, we're made to be cultivators. We're, we're created to cultivate. Believe it or not, you're a cultivator. If you're a man here, you are a cultivator just by your design. What you cultivate is a different story. But you want to cultivate. You want to build. You, you want to create. You want to grow things, right? Even if you don't have the discipline, you have the desire. Anybody like me? Like, you, you get excited about working out, right? You want to be, you, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get serious. You go pay your money for a gym membership, but you pay $200 for some program, and you get in there, and you get it for all of a week. It's not that you don't have the desire to cultivate your body and sculpt it into something. It's that you don't have the discipline. Right? It's hard work. It's toilsome. Right? Technology, we want it bigger. We want it faster. It's not that we, we, we don't have a desire to cultivate. Sometimes we don't have the discipline. I mean, there's a lot of guys sitting at home cultivating how to be the best on video games instead of out in the world cultivating and, and growing and building something. And so there's this desire, but the, the, the problem is, is that when sin entered the world, it, it created toil, right? The earth is cursed because of sin. And it says, now, Adam, you're going to work from the sweat of your brow. 
See, work was good. Cultivating was good. Adam enjoyed cultivating prior to the fall. Then the fall comes. Sin enters the world, and now it's toilsome. So sin fractures everything. Where there was once food and no gluttony, there's gluttony. Right? Where, where there was drinking with no drunkenness, now there's drunkenness. Sex, lust, and laziness enters the picture. And men are cultivating, but when sin enters in verse 14, Genesis 3.14, now the ground is cursed, and in pain you shall eat for the rest of your days. So he makes man a cultivator, and he does it all without toil or wearisome or burdensome. Man enjoys it, but now everything is falling down. So everything that God has asked us men to cultivate is frustrating us. It's, it's filled with toil. In your bathroom, you're working, you're fixing it up, it's looking good. Look at your plastering walls. You're like, yeah, I'm feeling like a man. Got your drill, drilling holes, and all of a sudden your bathroom floods. I go, Seriously? It's toilsome. It's the fall, man. Blame it on Adam. Just saying, your bathroom gets jacked up, that's Adam's fault. <laughs> but, but, but that's what happened to my dad. That's why my dad left. It was burdensome. He was put here to cultivate a son and a wife. To cultivate my heart, to raise me up in the fear and the admiration of the Lord. And he failed. You know why? Because it was burdensome. It was toilsome. It was too hard. So he abandoned us. And that's the problem. Right? Sin has entered the world. And now we're like, oh, man, this manhood stuff. I think I'd rather just learn how to play video games. Forget trying to cultivate a young lady's heart. Forget trying to uh, respect her and, and guard her heart. And, and forget trying to lead by example and teach other young men to be responsible and disciplined. No. Sin is into the world. So how do we get here? What happened? Right? Sin is into the world and, and now we don't know what it means to be a man. We don't have this, any idea. We're, we've created our new standards because that picture of masculinity is too difficult. And so here we are in the West. I mean, this is, you know, and we have no ceremonial rite of passage to become men. Right? When do you become a man? When you're 18? When you lose your virginity? When you have your first beer? Pint, excuse me. When do you become a man? We have no ceremonial rite of passage. I was in Kenya. I was with the Maasai, the Maasai warriors. Intense. Right? Intense men. Tall as me. These men, historically, would have to go kill a lion. And if you return, you're a man. I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take that. That's man stuff right there. They know, at least they know, like, yo, yo, I killed that lion right there, so I'm a man now. <laughs> Don't tell me I'm not a man. Got lion blood on my hands right now. I'm a man. Right there, have a ceremonial rite of passage. We have nothing. So we're, we're, we're confused, we're disillusioned, we don't understand what we're supposed to be or, or when we become men. Let me tell you about manhood, right? I'm, well, let's get into that. Because, men, I want you to be able to tell your daughter what she should be looking for. Ladies, I want you to know what you should be looking for. Right, men, I want, I want you to know what to say if your son says, Dad, what does it mean to be a man? And so... Number one, men were created by God to be social and spiritual. Men were created by God to be social and spiritual. When men abandon this, all kind of disillusionment happens. When men abandon the pursuit to be social and spiritual, they get disillusioned. They become directionless, troubled. And you know who suffers most of the time? Women and children. Right? Most of the violent crimes that happen are not committed by women. They're committed by men. Most of the rapes are not committed by women, they're committed by men. Right? Family life gets harmed, children get harmed and hurt, and society gets all jacked up. Why? Because men are directionless and are not pursuing social and spirituality. You know, the number one fear of, of young boys and young kids is that their fathers are going to leave their mothers. Number two, male leadership is not natural, it's supernatural. 
It's not a natural thing, right? It's supernatural to say, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be that guy and I'm going to do that. No, it's not. You don't naturally do that. It's something supernatural, right? God has given man a blueprint. He's given man a specific will to obey, a work to do, and a woman to love and protect. He's given man a will to obey, a work to do, and a woman to love and protect. And so, looking back in the scriptures, we see Adam failing ridiculously in these particular areas. And if we contrast Adam and Jesus, you see two completely different pictures of masculinity. Two completely separate approaches to masculinity. And here's the reality for all of us in here, all these, all us men in here. You're following one or the other. There's no in-between. You're either following the first Adam or the second Adam. We're all on one of those trajectories. So let's talk about that. Because these two individuals are, are leaders of two distinct destinies, right? They're leading people to two different places. You follow Adam, you're going to end up in one place. You follow Jesus, you're going to end up in another. This is how the gospel impacts masculinity. If you look at Romans 5, verse 17 and 19, we see the Bible even making this contrast between Jesus and Adam. So in Romans 5, verse 17, it says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Two distinct destinies. One man, through his sin, we've all been led to one distinct destiny. And one man, through his obedience, we can be justified and have a whole different existence and destiny. And so they're leaders of two distinct pictures of masculinity. Right? The first Adam is earthly. The second one is spiritual. And so what is a real man? I'm going to give you just kind of a a, 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 a 30,000 foot quick definition, right? A real man is someone who rejects passivity. A real man is someone who rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, and invests eternally. He rejects passivity. He accepts responsibility. He leads courageously, and he invests eternally. Did Adam do that? Let's look And see, did Adam reject passivity? No, he was passive. Right? He was passive. What happened in Genesis chapter 3? Adam was given the command to not eat the fruit. God says, you should not eat the fruit of this tree. Who did he tell that to? Eve? No, he told that to Adam. That was Adam's command. And when Eve sees the fruit, it says Adam was there with her. You look at Genesis chapter 3 verse verse 6. I mean, Adam is there as Eve is eating this fruit. Now, something, either a couple things happen here. Either one, Adam is like, I'm just going to see what happens to her. She didn't die. Or he never told her. He never gave her the command that God gave him. Passively, he stands by and watches his wife do the thing that God said they should not do. Passively. I've seen it in my own home. 
I desire to be passive sometimes in the same way. I come home, I got three kids. Five, three, and one. It's not a game in my house. It's not a game. I come home, it's chaos. I just came from working. I got to come home to work again. I just, my daughter's, he hit me, he pushed me. The baby's, ah, I stink. Somebody do something about this. (laughs) My wife is, I'm cooking and I'm going crazy right now. You know what I want to do? I'm just going to sit back and watch TV because this is crazy over here. I've had a long day. I'd much rather just be passive and let this chaos ensue. It's Adam, idly sitting back, watching the chaos take place. He's passive. Let me move on. (laughs) Right? Did Adam accept responsibility? We already know he did not reject passivity. Did he accept responsibility? Well, they both ate the fruit. God comes into the garden and says, hey, what's going on here? What just happened? Does Adam say, look, I take full credit. I was being passive. I should have said something. I didn't. And whatever happens, spare her. Let it happen to me. Is that how it went down? That's not, that's not the Bible I have. In my Bible, he says, the woman you gave me, the, the woman you gave me, he didn't accept responsibility. He blame shifted. He shifted the blame on her. See, if you wouldn't have gave me the woman, which ultimately is him shifting the blame on God. See, she, and if you wouldn't have gave me her, then I, so really it's your fault that I ate the fruit. That's ultimately what we're doing. We don't accept responsibility. We ultimately, we're blaming God. We're blame shifters and we're saying, well, they, and if you didn't, then, then ultimately it's your fault. It's your fault, God. Adam didn't accept responsibility, right? He disregarded his responsibility. He blamed Eve. And the first Adam abandoned his post of leadership. He was made to cultivate. He was made to be God's poema. He was made to be a demonstration of the ultimate cultivator, and he blew it. He didn't walk in masculinity. He didn't lead courageously. He sure enough wasn't thinking about investing eternally because he's like, well, we could live right forever if we leave this fruit alone. He wasn't thinking about an eternal investment. Adam blew it. And, and, And now that's the trajectory that most of us men want to be on. It's just easier that way. It's just not toilsome. It's not hard. I'd rather just be good at video games and skateboarding and and call it a day. And so then you have Jesus. Right? I did a song just like you. And and as I was walking through the song, I was painting a picture of all these terrible models of masculinity that I had. And then I, I, I said, in steps Jesus. All men were created to lead, but we needed somebody to lead us more than a teacher, but somebody to buy us back from the darkness. You can say he redeemed us. In steps Jesus, the second Adam, who in fact rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, and invests eternally. See, I love the way Jesus accepts responsibility, right? He wasn't passive at all. If he was passive, he would have never wrapped himself in human flesh, came to exist on this earth to to, to live the life we couldn't live and die the death that we deserve to die. He didn't reject passivity. And you want to talk about accepting responsibility? Who do you know that says, I will take their sin on my back? I know I didn't do it. I know I had nothing to do with it, but I'll I'll take full responsibility for that. That's man stuff. Have some kids and let them break something down the street at the neighbor's house. You didn't break it, but you say, you know what? I take responsibility. I'll pay for that. That's me. I own that one. That's man stuff. Right. And that's what Jesus ultimately does. We have a will to obey. You know what Jesus, a will to obey. You know what Jesus says? My will is, my, my, my will is to do the will of my father. My food is his will. My will is his will. 
He embraces God's will as, hey, this is what I am here to obey. There's no other will to supersede this one. There's no other uh, master to supersede the, the father. So he takes on that will to obey. He had a work to do. He said, I have work to do. My father's work. John 17. Right? My father's work is that I've got work to do. And men, you have work to do. You have a will to obey and you have a work to do. And you have a woman to love. Oh, Jesus loved his woman to death. You're like, hold on, wait a minute. Jesus had a woman? You want some Da Vinci Code stuff, Craig? What's happening right now? No. His bride, the church. He loved her to the death. He sacrificed himself for her. He was a life giver to this woman, not a life taker. Most of us men are life takers. I've been a life taker more than I've been a life giver. Right? Men existing to see what they can get from a woman instead of trying to add value, to add life to her. Draining life from her. Got her crying to her mother. I don't know. He just doesn't call. I don't know what to do. I don't know. And, and you're sitting back like, hey, you know, I don't know, you know. Are you going to pay for my meal? Because I don't, I'm, hard, I'm having a hard time at work. You know, I just saw on and Lazy life drainers. That's Adam. He drained life. We're sitting here now because of that. And Jesus gives life. Which one are you following? Right? So he's done incredibly well at loving his bride. The second Adam chose to lead courageously. Men were created to lead. It takes courage. It takes some courage to lead. It's not easy. Right? Jesus led where Adam didn't. He set direction. You want to be a man? Follow Jesus. Jesus knew his direction. He knew where he was going. He knew his course. He wasn't wandering aimlessly trying to figure stuff out. He provided. Right? And man, I'm just going to be honest. If you really want to, 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 to pursue this trajectory, you're going to have to master something. And that's your emotions. Right? Feelings aren't facts. I know you may feel like this. I know you may feel like that. A lot of times we can be led by anger. We can be led by, by lust. We can be led by all these different things. But feelings aren't facts. We've got to master that. But not in our own will. Not in our own strength but in the power that God provides through the Holy Spirit. The power of the gospel through the Spirit. So you can't just bootstrap this manhood thing. You can't just, you know what, I'm going to do this. No, it doesn't work that way. You need a power outside of yourself to be able to do that, and that power is provided in the Holy Spirit. All right, so we believe in the power of the gospel because it changes us, and the Spirit gives, enables us to do these things. And that's how you're going to be able to approach masculinity. That's how you're going to be able to approach it. So what happens when we start to cultivate and work and, and it gets hard, right? These difficulties remind us of the gospel, right? That's what's happening. We're learning the gospel. We're learning that, that these adversities are, 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 are things that we can't take on in and of ourselves, that we need God to do this. We're reminded, man, I'm dead, and if you don't resurrect me, there's no hope. I've got to trust in someone and something outside of myself to get this done. And it reminds us, ah, I need you, Jesus. I need you. I, I can't do this. I can't be the perfect father and the perfect leader and the perfect husband, the perfect employer, the perfect per I need you, Jesus. I need the power of the gospel to work in and through me. And so I, I don't rest in the power of Lecrae. I rest in the power of the Spirit. Can't accomplish this without gospel power. Marriage is tough. You're not going to make it in marriage without the gospel. I'm just going to be honest with you. First two years of my marriage were the darkest times of my life. It taught me the gospel. It taught me to go to the cross. It taught me to say, you know what? I'm here to sacrifice. I'm here to absorb. I'm not here to get all I can get out of her. I'm here to give her all of me. They say marriage isn't 50-50, it's 100-0. You go in not expecting anything. You give all you have. Now, if both sides are giving all they have, we got a great marriage. If one side is giving 
A hundred, like, hey, we're, I'm not going to give you 50 until I get my hundred. <laughs> right? You're going to have self-centeredness. The problem is always sin. And the answer is always the gospel. Always the gospel. So what are we cultivating, right? Like, what are we cultivating, man? What are we building? What are we establishing? What are we pouring our lives into? And through what strength and what power are we doing that? Are you just trying to be the best uh, Xbox player you can be? Are you learning how to cultivate? Are you learning how to lead courageously, reject passivity, accept responsibility? Right? What are you building? Are we being spiritual cowards? I don't, I, don't have, I don't have a lot of tolerance for it. The guys that come to small groups the first week, yeah, I'm struggling with porn. Okay, well, we're going to pray for you. We're going to give you some, some, some stuff that we can work through. The next week, I'm struggling with porn. Okay, all right. Next week, yeah, beat me again today. Where, where's, your, where's your war effort at, man? Where's your strength? Where's your reliance on the spirit? Are you fighting? First Timothy calls us to fight. This is a war. I love how Piper says, you never know what prayer is for until you know that life is war. It's not going to be easy to reject passivity, accept responsibility, to lead courageously. You've got to fight. It's a war. You don't fight in your own might. You fight in the power of the gospel. You fight with Jesus as the perfect example and picture of masculinity. You think Jesus didn't fight? You think he wasn't in the garden pleading with the Lord? Take this cup if you can. You think he wasn't bleeding, sweating drips of blood in agony? He was. But it didn't stop him. It didn't deter him from taking on the responsibility. You know what a man looks like? Look at Jesus. Uh, Story of a leader at a church. Profound leader. Godly man, um, led a mission trip to a foreign country and uh, learned the language, learned the culture. And, um, you know, many men trusted him. Wife, beautiful wife, kids, great family, godly family. Gets to this country, starts to minister on the streets starts reaching out to prostitutes, ends up committing adultery with prostitutes, ends up being mastered by his sin, not wanting to repent. Comes back, his wife says, I'm, I'm here for you, I'm willing to stay, I'm willing to work this out, I'm willing to go to counseling, your kids need you, we need you. He says, I can't. I can't. The pastors, the elders, they say, what, what's the problem? We're all willing to fight with you, to work with you, to war with you. What, what's going on? He says, I'm just tired of fighting. I'm just tired of fighting. Man, this is not going to be easy. But you have to remember this is a war, and it's a war, and it's a fight to the finish. Paul says, I finished the race. I fought the good fight. He didn't mean I did that last year. He meant I did that last night. To his death, he fought in the strength that God provided. To his death, he followed Jesus. He's our hope and our redemption. In the same chapter, Genesis 3, where we see the fall and the curse happen and we see sin marring us and, 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 and pushing us toward uh, embracing passivity and not being responsible, we see God give us hope. Right? He doesn't leave us out there saying, hey, I'm sorry, it's just all bad for you. Genesis 3.15, we see the first gospel. In Genesis 3.15, we, we see that the seed of woman will crush the serpent's head and his heel will be bruised. 
we see God give us a promise that the seed of woman, I don't know if you know, but women don't have seed. There's only one woman who's conceived without a man. That would be Mary. We're seeing Jesus come and he will crush the head of the serpent, but only his heel will be bruised. Serpent will be murdered, be killed. Satan will be done away with. You'll be bruised. He gives us hope that one will come. A Messiah will come to lead the way. Even after we've blown it. And my encouragement to you men and ladies who are, are struggling with what does this man look like. If you don't know what it means to be a man. If you're wrestling. If you feel like oh my gosh this is so hard. You have the power in the power of the spirit. And in the same moment you feel inadequate, in the same moment you realize you've been marred by sin, you're so distant from what true biblical manhood looks like, there is hope for you in Jesus. There is hope in the gospel. That if you blew it up until this very moment, there is redemption in Christ, in the gospel. Let's pray. Uh, <clears throat> Father, I thank you for the opportunity that you give us to see your face clear. Um, I'm eternally grateful for you providing us with uh, hope, redemption in Jesus. Thankful for uh, God, that though we are marred by sin, that though a, the picture of uh, a life that honors you sometimes feels so far away from our grasp, it's not. That you've provided hope in Christ. Lord, that our, our lives are redeemable. And and God, we're never too far. So, God, again, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for uh, being the example, setting the pace, setting the direction in Christ. That he who knew no sin became sin. We give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, quickly, I don't know, where we, what are we looking like in my... Did I go way out the, the park? Okay, good. Um, one thing I want to express, and I don't know everyone's agenda, um, but I am a music artist, right? What I don't want to perpetuate is the idea that your talent makes you a leader, that your talent earns you the right to lead people, to shepherd people, to... Uh, be on stages and behind desks. Um, it is your discipline, it is your faithfulness, it is your obedience, it is your submission to both Christ, the church, eldership uh, that allows for this to happen. And uh, personally, I've, I've come here with, uh, with my pastor, Pastor Lance, you mind uh, standing up and just saying what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> right on. But, uh, but I've come here with him because I want others to see that this is not the Lecrae show. That this is not, oh, all I have to do is write some good songs and lead in creative ways and I then uh, deserve a platform or a megaphone to be able to speak my perspective. And so... Um, I want you to pay as much attention to these pastors and leaders, Pastor Ephraim and Steve, uh, who are here that don't have albums out, uh, because these are the men that labor day in and day out with people and deserve to be up here um, articulating these incredible truths. And so I, I really want you to give them deference, time, attention, and, um, you know, that's just, that's my prayer. I just came to open it up, open up that I'm an opening act basically. So, uh, but I appreciate y'all's time. I'm eternally grateful. Thank y'all. Hope I'll see y'all at the, the release and uh, God bless. Yeah.